Uh, Frank, thank you for your talk. Terrific. Um, I don't know whether you know John McCarthy uh, coined the phrase artificial intelligence, MIT, Stanford, etc. And he said, uh, this is not actually relevant. I'll try to not make this a talk, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's actually close to the, the leadership, the, the topic you addressed. But he said, um, those who don't practice arithmetic are doomed to talk nonsense. And so I would like to suggest that in politics, uh, public policy is being advised by schlock science. I'm not thinking particularly of global whining, but it's, it's just extraordinary how, how science and, and data are, are ignored by politicians and, and the bureaucracy. It's like the gut feel. I know in my heart it's right, but they don't actually engage the brain. Would you like to discuss that topic? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. You know, sort of <laughs> well, there, there's one simple point that I would make, which is um, if you've got children and they're in school these days, uh, invariably uh, the teachers will tell you, you know, our school is very special, it's a brilliant school, and we're child-centered, that's what makes it so special. And part of being child-centered is that you don't get the children to do things that they don't want to naturally do. You know, sort of because that's really imposing adult values on children. That's a, apparently a bad thing these days. It used to be called socialization. Now it's called a bad thing. Now, one of the things that children don't like to do, I mean, I, maybe, there is, maybe you have a child that's different, is to learn the timetables. I mean, I've never yet met a child that says, Daddy, Daddy, you know, I, could you teach me how much four times four is? And, you know, that's not what children do. That's not something that anybody who is a child naturally desires to do. And yet, we know that unless children memorize the timetables and, and do something that they're not really interested in doing at that age, unless they do that, they're not going to develop the conceptual you know, sort of equipment to deal with detail, to think methodically, to think logically, and ultimately to think creatively, because creativity and experimentation is based upon rigor. I mean, underlying it, everything is rigor. And that's really where leadership al also comes in, because uh, you know, the whole capacity to have a presence, to initiate, uh, is built based on a confidence that comes from rigorous thinking. People often think that uh, good leaders who kind of appear to be talking effortlessly, who kind of come up with the good ideas, kind of dreamt it like in a cartoon, a bubble lights up and a light bulb kind of lights up and that's it. It's ultimately based on rigor. So I think in that sense, that is really quite important. Then I do get embarrassed when I hear politicians you know, who confuse South Korea with North Korea, right? Or who basically think that you know, Paris you know, sort of is the capital city of Belgium. When you, you know, when you have that kind of ignorance among our leaders, you do worry a little bit. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Frank. Um, we've been just lamenting at our table the decline of conviction politicians. And so I wonder if you can reflect on that as part of your argument. Is this an inevitable thing as leadership declines that we don't have conviction politicians anymore? Or do you think we will see conviction politicians rise again? Or maybe we shouldn't see them? Well, I think that conviction can be understood in, 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 in many different ways because there is uh, ideological conviction, there's religious conviction, but there's also the conviction that comes about through your commitment to the institution that you're working for. And one of the real problems that has occurred is that uh, in the world that we live in, uh, people are not encouraged to take responsibility for their decision. We have all these mechanisms that make that very difficult, and one of them is the use of consultants, and one of them is the use of outside bodies. We outsource decision-making to a lot of different organizations. And I think under those circumstances, not only do you not have conviction politicians, but you're not even convinced about the merits of, of the work you're doing yourself. Because the only way you ever become convinced about something is by taking responsibility for it. I think that, that act of uh, there being a relationship between action and outcomes and you being responsible for it 
is ultimately the most important ways that we internalize just what it is that we're doing. And that's why quite often you end up not really believing what you're saying. I, yesterday, I mean, it's not a, a party political matter. I heard Julia Gillard give a speech, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, I just arrived, and, and she was asked about um, what she thought about Obama Barack, because they, they had a discussion together. And she said, I, I, th I thought that Obama used the language of vision, is what she said. And I thought it was very interesting. She said, Obama uses the language of vision. As if somehow, you know, a president or a prime minister can go home and they can have a language of doom, a language of disappointment, and they kind of, in a manipulative way, use a language rather than genuinely speak what's in their heart. And I think to that extent, you know, we do have a problem because it's not only that we haven't got conviction in the big, with a capital C, we're not even convinced ourselves quite often about the minute details of policy, which I think does create a lot of difficulties. Frank, I want to take you back to the beginning of your um, <coughs> comments when you expressed some fairly healthy cynicism about what's happened in Greece and Italy in recent times with the appointments of prime ministers. Um, I know the Greek prime minister, I do know Mario Motti fairly well. He um, has some uh, quite outstanding credentials, first of all being the competition enforcer in the EU and then he went into investment banking. Uh, and you think that's fairly outstanding cred credentials for leadership. But um, uh, what happened with him was that um, he, he showed the, the uh, the authoritas that you described when he was competition enforcer. He had courage, he had conviction, he had communication skills uh, and the like. Um, uh, in a sense, I wonder whether what hasn't happened in Italy and perhaps in Greece is that the, the parliament, because it's required the consent of both parties, that the parliament has actually taken a person with authoritas, a person who they recognise has the ability to say to the people, here's your problem and I'll fix it for you, and then they have elected him to that position subject always, of course, to removal by the very same people that have elected the position that's the parliament of Italy or of Greece concerned. Well, I mean, that, in, in principle, is a, is a, is, could, could be plausible, but from, from what I hear, when I ask people, why is uh, Monti a prime minister, for example, uh, they basically say that, they give, you, they give me two reasons. One is that because he's not Berlusconi, right? He's the, he's the very opposite including lacking humor and, you know, sort of having a charisma bypass and all, all those other things. <laughs> but what they also say is a safe pair of hands. And now, you might think, well, okay, we need a safe pair of hands, but when we say a safe pair of hands, what that really means is that his hands are not going to the tail of the Italian public purse. Or what it really means is that he's not going to make things worse. And that's not what leadership is. I think what we need is, at the moment, is not really a safe pair of hands in that kind of defensive way. I think what Italy needs is somebody that's going to take on the Italian bureaucracy, that's going to take on you know, all, the, all the institutional obstacles that exist, that are going to confront Italian people with the fact that Italy has got one of the lowest rates of productivity in the whole of Europe. And that's not going to happen, I think, with this particular prime minister. So I'm not against people you know, sort of being put in places because they got genuine leadership. But I think anybody that's got, it, got their kind of, kind of authority on the basis of being a commissioner uh, in the EU is unlikely to be able to face those kinds of pressures. Oh. Frank, I must also say that I take issue with your portrait of the Italian prime minister and with European leadership crisis in general. I think the problem for Europe is not so much that they have too little leadership, but they have too much of it. They've got 27 leaders in Europe, plus the European Commission. And the problem for Europe is that they can't agree on which path they're going to take. And when you're talking about the Italian Prime Minister, I think he has shown great leadership as European Commissioner. He has taken on the biggest companies of the world in antitrust suits. I mean, you may not agree with these particular lawsuits, but I think he has shown courage. And when you compare him to the previous Prime Minister of Italy, you can see that the previous Prime Minister had all the charisma and authority that you want. He won elections. He was in power for 17 years on and off. And I think uh, nobody in his right mind would claim that Berlusconi was a great leader. So I think, really, uh, give them a bit more credit. I think Italy in its current position will probably struggle to find anyone better than Mario Monti to lead the current, of its current uh, out of its current crisis because I think 
He may not be elected, but he's got the potential, he's a good economist, he's got uh, the background as, a, as an academic economist, as a European Commissioner, and if there's anyone qualified to take Italy out of its current crisis, it's Mario Monti. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can disagree uh, about what makes a, a leader, and uh, I'm quite happy to uh, sort of accept the fact that you can have individuals who, who've never been tested in the public domain miraculously turning into leaders, but you know, maybe I'm a simpleton, but I take the view that uh, at a time of major political crises in Europe, the only way that you're going to have any solutions to the problems facing Europe is if you have leaders who've come through a discussion and a, and a debate with their own public, right? who've, come up, who've, who've got legitimacy through the process of some kind of an electoral contest. Unless you got that legitimacy which has been given to you through some measure of public consent, then you are merely an isolated individual. And I actually take the view that anybody who spent so much time being a European commissioner, who's benefited from the privilege of insulated decision making, who's been able to have a lot of courage in take, making decisions without having to account for it to the electorate, is actually not what I call a leader, but, but an, an effective manager of a particular institution. And I think there's a danger of confusing good managers with good leaders. And I'm quite happy to accept the fact that Monty is a wonderful manager. But whether he's a leader or not, you don't know and I don't know because there's never been any experience that gives us the, the slightest signal that, 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 that he is that. We, I mean, we're just speculating because he's never had to lead anything. So I do think we need to take a reality check and not imagine that just because you, have, you got a good economics degree, then you go, you, that gives you the possibility of solving the economic problems of a nation that's in big economic trouble. Uh, Frank, um, a more theological question, I guess. To uh, what extent does leadership, do you think, involve love or the service of others in leadership? Well, I think it, it involves those elements because presence, establishing a presence, involves being able to suspend your own ego at times, to kind of transcend your own personality, not to always think of yourself as being the most important person in the room, but to think of the service that you're providing to your community or to your nation, or to think of the issues that really concern you as, as what it is that drives you on. And I think that uh, a good leader is somebody that uh, knows when to be in the background, but knows that from time to time, being in the background is not good enough. You have to really lead from the front, and it's getting that balance right between the different uh, challenges that you have the leader that's so important. But the, it seems to me that uh, the question of service and commitment to service comes about through a relationship that you have with the community, which is why I always come back to the point that leaders are not people that you parachute in into a community. They, they don't they just simply appear from nowhere. They come about through this organic interaction between the people that you work with or you serve or you, uh, who you've been elected to represent uh, and not just simply things that come out of your own head. Frank, you've had a crack at leaders tonight and I tend to agree with you in terms of politically the type of leaders we've got at the moment. But they say that you get the leaders that you deserve because you vote them in. So with the fact that we've got such weak leadership at the moment, what does that tell you about the people? Rather than the leaders, what does that tell you about the people and their mood as to why this can happen? Well, I, I think uh, what you say is, is right to about 25% of the, of the overall answer because you, you know, you're right to suggest that you know, the public bears some responsibility for their representatives. But I always take the view that part of leadership is to educate the public. And if, if, I, if I look around Europe at the moment, uh, what I see is a decade and decade long process of demotivating the public, uh, of leaders and commissioners and the EU bureaucracy treating the people as if they were children, of uh, being affronted when it's suggested that they have a referendum on an issue, but they have to fight out you know, and having an argument about a particular issue. And I think under those circumstances, you know, they have contributed 
to making the public more passive and more insecure. So to that extent, I think it's a bit of both. But I wouldn't want to absolve the public of responsibility because at the end of the day, they got to, you know, they got to kind of step up and, and play that kind of a role. But I, I think at the end, we also have to remember that our elites, to some extent, are, are te the, who are meant to be teaching the public, bear a tremendous burden of responsibility for the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Thanks. Um, but no one's actually got a mandate. If you look at the minority governments and how many shared governments there are and minority parties, no one's actually got a mandate to rule. So isn't that as a result of people actually creating that outcome? So part of the reason why the Greeks went to referendum was that they wanted actually to get a mandate to make a decision. Well, I, well, I think that there is some truth in that, but the mandate issue is a bit wider than that because if you look all the way around Europe, you know, at the, at, at the, so far tonight we've been talking about the Greeks and the, and the Italians, but actually the, the whole question of irresponsibility extends to France. You know, Germany, I think, is, is not a, above it all. I mean, the Germans protest that somehow they're the victims for having lent Greek all that money that they now want back, but the Germans are as accomplices, and they have, a, they have a government that has a mandate. The British have a government. I mean, all these governments, all the governments that are more stable regimes, all have mandated governments, but they're no less responsible for the current state of affairs um, than anybody else is. And I, I, I think it's often uh, wrong to blame the weak links in the chain for the problems that everybody in Europe was equally responsible for. And if there's anybody that's more responsible than anybody else, it's the Germans, you know, who've managed to have a productive economy uh, and do really well by selling their goods to European countries uh, on the basis of that lending them money that they knew that they couldn't really afford to borrow. And then they kind of protest when somehow there is a, a, a financial crisis at the end, so. Um, just looking around the world today, or even Australia, um, who, who do you actually like as a leader that embodies the principles that you've talked about? Yeah, I, Greg is a good guy. I mean, he's, you know, he's got, he's got potential in that department, you know, sort of. I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's not the individuals, because, uh, you know, you and I can have different views about individuals, and whether I'm right or wrong will only be known to the experience that's going to happen in the next few years ahead because leaders are tested and found one thing or they rise to the occasion. What I'm really talking about is not the individuals. What I'm really talking about is a leadership culture because for, any, for there to be good leaders, you, know, you need teams of individuals who are interacting with each other. You need leadership at all levels. You need leadership in the military, in the police. You need leadership in, in, in civic organizations and, and, and in businesses. And, I'm always struck by the fact that in societies where leadership is weak, at the political level, you often find that the police is very disoriented and is always full of excuses about why it is that they never solve you know, the, the problem of crime. And you go and look at businesses and, and they explain that it's not their fault. You know, it's, it's, it's the global economy, it's the old excuse, it's the global economy. So, so they all have the same excuses and I think it's a cultural issue that we need to confront, which is why I talk so much about, you know, sort of uncertainty, uh, the importance of taking risks seriously, of freedom, because it's when we internalize those values as a community that leadership really kicks in and, and, and begins to gain traction. At our table, the discussion pretty quickly got around to Alan Joyce of Quant Qantas. And uh, the, the, well, the consensus of the little corner I was on, anyway, was that the guy's a hero and he showed enormous courage in what he did. And um, rather than being a risk manager, he um, was a, a risk taker. He, th he threw everything in, uh, in one big throw. It wasn't risk management, it was just taking one risk. And uh, if he'd lost, he would have lost his job, he would have lost his career, he probably would have had to leave the country. Um, so I'm just wondering, in all the literature that you've um, been reading, and, and uh, uh, where, where is the place for courage and heroism in leadership, and, and risking everything 
um, and there's other, other Australians as well. Chris Corrigan did the same uh, a, a decade ago. Um, managing, it seems to me, managing an organisation where everything's stable and things are going along smoothly is okay, but these are, these are dark days, and um, do we need heroes and men of courage, or women of courage, and um, risk takers like Alan Joyce? I think what we need uh, before we talk about courage is the capacity to make judgment because it's only when we know how to make judgment calls in a kind of balanced way that we know the difference, for example, between cowardice, courage, and recklessness. I mean, one of the things we learned from Aristotle is that the most difficult thing is to find the middle way because if you push courage too far, then it becomes recklessness. If, on the other hand, you say tomorrow or, or the day after tomorrow or you procrastinate, then that becomes cowardice. And to be genuinely brave and to have real courage requires beforehand the capacity to make that judgment as to just how far to go. And the example you gave, I think, is an example of courage, you know, which ultimately was based on that individual's uh, ability to use his power of discretion in an effective leadership kind of a way.